Burns, what's your drink? My drink is green tea. I have it every day, and it looks like I'll uh, drive home. <laughs> Yeah, I've got a uh, dirty martini here, vodka. Good for you. Uh, well, you know, we're in the trunk club. It seemed like a martini kind of place. When in the trunk club. When in the trunk club. Welcome. Thank, Thank you, you so much for doing this. Uh, the big question is how did you get here? How did you become Ken Burns? You know, my first memory is of my dad building a dark room in the basement of our tract house, a development in Newark, Delaware, and then being in his arms as the magic alchemy of developing yeah. a photograph. So he was an anthropologist, but he was also, as a hobbyist, a uh, still photographer. So that was in my, my sort of DNA. And then my mom had cancer for 10 years, and after she had died when I was 11, sometime when I was 12, my dad and I would let me, he would let me stay up really late to look at old movies and I watched him break down and cry and I'd never seen him cry, not while my mom was sick, not when she died, not at the funeral. He cried and I instantaneously, age 12, said, I want to be a filmmaker to myself. Because I, I realized that films had somehow provided my father, guarded and of course beset by all of these things, with some safe haven, some ability to say, I feel comfortable, I feel safe here, and that I can express emotions because these films created emotions. Now that meant, back in 1965, 66, that I would be Alfred Hitchcock or John right. Ford or right. Howard Hawks, but I ended up going to Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts. Small school, right? Very small, brand new. I went the second year. So on. you went there thinking, I'm going to be a, a documentary, filmmaker. Fi documentary uh, no, filmmaker? There, no, Just I filmmaker. was still feature filmmaker, and I had this encyclopedic knowledge of, of feature films and the history of film, and they basically said, you know, they call it the industry. Um, you know, there is as much drama in what is and what was than anything the human imagination dreams up. And all of a sudden, I had my molecules kind of rearranged, and I ended up being documentary filmmaker. And then this un, this thing sort of came out of the back of my subconscious, which had been this love of my country, love of American history, completely untrained and untutored. Last time I took an American history course was in 11th grade, you know, really? where they make people, you take okay, it. Okay, people will be shocked They'll be that. shocked. And because I, they probably so think you have a PhD in, in college. History. In college, I took a Russian history course. So that's, that's, <laughs> that's it. That's it. So, but I knew my country, I felt it viscerally, felt the life of my country. And I began to understand early on that if you see your country in the same sympathetic way that you might see an ind individual, a close friend or a family member, then what had happened to me, the early death of a mother, this traumatic event in my childhood, was not dissimilar to the Civil War. So I found myself building up this tension and tension of having to do the Civil War, even though the first several films that I did on the Brooklyn Bridge, the history of the religious sect, the Shakers, Huey Long. Yeah, I'm not gonna let you gloss over all of that. Yeah. <laughs> Your first film, the first professional film, was yeah. about a bridge. Yeah. The Brooklyn Bridge. So I looked 12 years old. <laughs> And uh, people would say, this child is trying to sell me the Brooklyn Bridge. No, because it's PBS. So we're all going out trying to get grant funding. And people go, they need to go. How this, old were you? I was in my 20s, okay. but I looked 12. You looked 12. And, then, and people would say that, or they would go, OK, an hour on a bridge? I mean, five minutes? I go, no, 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 you don't understand. And it's this great story. I'm not sure I can keep it to an hour. How did you convince them? I just wore them down. I used to have <laughs> on my desk two three-ring binders that were like three or four inches thick with all the rejections just from that film. That, that's when I wanted a thousand bucks or 2,500 bucks from a foundation or, an, or a company or somebody wait, in Wait, wait, this York. is important. You had two three ring binders filled with rejections? Rejections, yeah. And I just kept them there as a reminder that, you know, you may have talent, but unless you push through all this stuff, if, unless you persevere, it's not going to happen. And I love that fact that people had said no so many times and I just went, okay, and kept going until I had accumulated a handful of yeses that allowed me to film, yeah. and then I left New York City, which was too expensive, rather than put the footage up on my refrigerator or on a shelf and say, well, I'll get to it and get a real job, and then wake up at 45 and go, oh my god, I, I never didn't did do that. that. So yeah. I moved to this tiny little village in rural New Hampshire to this house that I still live in to this day, in the same bedroom. And I made the finish the film. How long did it take to make Brooklyn Bridge? Well, you know, by the time I said yes to the idea of it, it was early 77. By the time I finished it was 
82, yeah. and, and people said, oh, you're so smart to time it for the centennial, which was in 83, <laughs> and I went, you have no idea, and it was, that was not, there'd been one centennial of the United States, and the Brooklyn Bridge was the second one, so it's not like people were into planning for those things as, as we do now, and I just would kind of swallow and say, you have no idea, because we literally had to reinvent a wheel of how you make old photographs come alive, how you use not just third person, uh, narration, but first-person voices to make the past come alive. Um, you know how you integrate all of this stuff, and how you apply to a documentary that's usually castor oil, telling you what you should know. The same laws of storytelling that apply to a feature filmmaker. Yeah, and that is what you become known for, right? You become known for your style. Yeah. I, I, I think I read that that Apple even has an app. Yeah, that is a, the Ken Burns. The Ken Burns app. effect is basically panning and zooming your photographs through, and it is a very superficial and highly used. I've saved lots of bar mitzvahs and <laughs> weddings and <laughs> right. vacations and things like that. But but my attempt is to wake the dead. I tried to take an old photograph and trust that it was once alive. So did it have a past? Would it have a future? And to try to tell a story about something in the past where we know how it turned out, but you'd sit on the edge of your chair thinking it might not turn out the way you know That's it did. The, key. the classic example is you go to Ford's Theater in our Civil War film and you hope this time the gun jams. And that's, that's good history. Yeah. That, and that's what I'm trying to learn. I still feel like I'm a student of that. That's the first one that I really remember in my, you know, my life is, is Civil War. And did that feel like a breakthrough moment for oh, you? Oh, totally, because I had spent a long time trying to convince people, like, give me some money to make an hour worth of still photographs come alive on the Brooklyn Bridge, the Shakers, the Statue of Liberty, Huey Long, the, the Congress, Thomas Hart Benton. But here I was asking people for a really long period of time to let still photographs. Trust me to tell a story that could come alive. There's no and, video of the Civil War. And there's War. no video of the <laughs> Civil no War. Film. And um, it was interesting because it was one of those watershed moments, not just for me in my life personally, but for all of us who worked on it and for documentaries because suddenly you had gangbuster ratings. It was 1990. There was only, you know, 15 or 20 channels. Nobody had ubiquitous cable, let alone an internet. And when you had 40 million people tuning into it and people stopping what they're doing right. in the evening and running on out of PBS, blank tape. On PBS, right? On PBS. I mean, it's, it's not, not supposed to happen that nothing way. Nothing against PBS. It's but still it's still the highest rated program there. And so Is it really? Still, yeah, still to this day? It's now 27 years later and it's still the highest rated program. Did someone teach you the, the Ken Burns method, the, the shooting of photographs, or, or did, did that just sort of evolve? How do, I, how do you well, really we, become? Nothing is new. I, I, I don't think anything is new. I, I certainly think my father's influence was still photographs. The f still photographers who taught us both film and photography at Hampshire College, particularly Jerome Liebling and Elaine Mays, they were talking about how you see a photograph. And so I was just trying to extend that and use my old desire to be a feature filmmaker and say, okay, each still photograph is what Hollywood would call a master shot. That means you have within it a long shot, a medium, a close, a tilt, a pan, a reveal, yeah. inserts of details, let's look at your bracelet, let's see your nails, let's right. see the thing you hold, what, whatever it is that you're going to do. And all of that could contribute to waking up that photograph. And it isn't just as the Apple Ken Burns effect has, it isn't just about um, visual movement, it's about sound. Are you, you know, you're listening to that photograph? Are the troops tramping? Are the guns firing? Is the bat cracking? Is the crowd cheering? That's as important. And I remember when I premiered, if that's the right word, at the Brooklyn Museum, the Brooklyn Bridge film, the first one, brought out my little 16 millimeter projector and the screen yeah, yeah, yeah. that I fumbled with. And the woman said, where did you get the films of the building of the Brooklyn Bridge? I said, ma'am, they were, it was made from 1869 to 1883. You must think of the later footage that I had in the second half of the film. She goes, no, I mean when they brought on those scows, the blocks of stone, right. and lifted it up. And these were still photographs that we'd added the sound of seagulls and water from lapping. From the 1850s? And men from the 1870s, 70s. basically. And um, men yelling and hoists and all this sort of stuff and a complex sound effect like Hollywood. And she, I kept saying, so those are still photographs. And she goes, no, they weren't. Did you have a mentor? I think Jerome Liebling would count mostly, he, you know, besides my dad. And, and really, in some ways, my mom, by dying, she yeah. left this gigantic hole. You were 11? 11, and she was sick for 10 years, so there was never a moment. I didn't have a childhood. And she left this gigantic hole, and look what I do. I make people from the past wake up.
That's what I do for a living. I know you've been on a huge run. <gasps> yeah. Because in case no one's, anyone's living in a cave, you've got this series on Vietnam. Yeah. So do you consider your series now on Vietnam to be advocacy, to be art, to be archive? How do you, what do you consider? Well, I it hope be? it would be Kate Art first and foremost. I want to tell a good story. And uh, I think that we haven't dealt with Vietnam. It's unfinished business for a lot of us in large measure because it didn't turn out the way we wanted it to, in large measure because so much of the country was against it, in large measure because we decided because it didn't turn out, we're not going to deal with it. And also people are still angry about mm -hmm. it. And they're, so we thought the only way to do it was to shed our own baggage, have no political agenda, have no ax to grind, be umpires calling balls and strikes, and just learn what we could. The last 42 years since the fall of Saigon has seen unbelievable scholarship in dozens of little areas, and we decided what if we could aggregate the work of all those scholars, go to Vietnam and enjoy unusual access that we yeah, had You interview there. a lot of Vietnamese. My co-director Lynn Novick did, and uh, the senior producer Sarah Botstein um, did as well, and get in, you know, in addition to all the Americans and just tell a story and you realize that today in, a, in our day and age when everything is binary, everything is black red state white. or blue state, black and white, that it's got to be good or bad, that you could see that there's a truth and the opposite of a truth could be true at the same time. There could be more than one truth. And so we allowed this space where all these multiple perspectives could coexist and we could tell the story of Vietnam and you could hear from a North Vietnamese soldier and then a U.S. Marine. I, I'm curious about your progression and how you managed to do so many things. I, you had a World War II series, I think, yeah. just before you started on the Vietnam yes. Project. But uh, uh, every... Do you, are they in parallel or are yes, you... Yes, they're staggered. So yeah. I have also several producing stems or families if you'd call it. So Lynn Novick and I have been working since yeah. baseball together and so did jazz and Frank are... Lloyd Wright and then she'll have a team that's day to day on something and after World War II or what, towards the end of it I said we have to do Vietnam but meanwhile I've been working on with Dayton Duncan a series of films from the West to Lewis and Clark to right. Mark Twain to Horatio's Drive to the National Parks and we were working on Dust Bowl and now we're working on country music and with my daughter I'd done one on the Central Park Five and then Jackie Robinson and now we're working on one on Muhammad Ali and another uh, producing stem <laughs> we're doing the Roosevelt's. So what happens is, is that it's really good for me. It's, I don't seed anything. I don't do as many interviews as I used to. I don't go to as many live shoots as I used to. That's okay. But where it counts, where our films are made mm -hmm. in the editing room, I'm there and I have the ultimate decision making. But also leaving the editing room and giving, say, the Vietnam editors two months, depending on where we are right. in the process, or two to weeks work before I come back. And then fresh eyes. Then I'm going to Nashville and interviewing Dolly Parton, or I'm doing the interview with this person, and I come back and I'm cleaner, I'm fresher, I don't right. have to, in, you know what I mean? It just makes me see it as I want you to see it, like new, and I can say to them, but, but why are we assuming that? Nobody knows that except us. Did it take years, though, to get to that point where you well, were, you know, well enough known, frankly, and you're famous enough, you can ring up anybody and... Ask well, for you funding know, now. Does it it, the funding is just as hard, and maybe because we've added more zeros to the end of it, and we're working on many more things. In the beginning, I realized there was an economy of scale of not just finishing a project and then going out to raise the money, because you starved until you got the money. So if you could do two things at once, you could then also keep your crew. You could go from the editing right. of the Vietnam editors, right. move the second that was edited to country music, right? So that was a big deal for them. They live in rural New Hampshire. Otherwise, they're out of work. And where are they going to find right. another big film job for right. a long time? So adding more and more things is an economy of scale for all of these things, for fundraising, for the staff, but also, I think, to keep me free of formula and b when I come back into, I'm about, I've been on the road for Vietnam, I'm about to go into a very significant screening of country music, editing screening in New Hampshire soon, and I'm going to be able to see it like it's brand new to me. When does country music come out? 2019? In a, in a couple of years, couple which years? is tomorrow. Uh, two, yeah, two years from now, 2019. Two years and from that now. Is, Tomorrow, I can't begin to tell you what that. Oh, two years is tomorrow. Oh, <laughs> to I you. just, I, I just, it's sort of like when you finish, just sing. Vietnam, we locked the entire thing by the end of 2015. This is before the Iowa caucuses. Two so, years prior to it uh, actually being seen by the rest of the world. Yes. Yeah, so wow. at that point, it was terrifying because we now had ten 
feature film length things, either two hours or 90 minutes, to sound edit, to cut, to online, to do all that stuff. And we use that time to also fix a little thing if we learn new scholarship. Yeah. But I was also, say, what make, if something changes? Well, we were able to do a little yeah. bit of that changing, and sometimes you make a decision. You know, wow, we were out in front of that thing of Nixon's involvement in the intervention with a foreign power. Sound familiar? In '68, getting the South Vietnamese mm -hmm. to boycott the peace talks, um, and I was sort of out in front. And then new scholarship showed that we were now behind. I thought, Let, let's just play a conservative. We want to bring everybody in on this. Let's just have, people says, who's your audience? And now we live in, a, in an age where people are, you, you self-select your news, so different. you self-select, and I fortunately have stayed with public television where actually we have high ratings in red well, states and, as well as blue states. And I was watching it on demand last night. Yeah. So, you know, and I've been watching it on demand because it's not, we don't right. schedule our lives, our lives around anymore. television anymore. Yeah. You have things scheduled, is it true, all the way through 2030? Well, that's, is that right? uh, I have stuff definitely scheduled through about 2021, which is the country music. We're doing a biography yeah. of Ernest Hemingway, a biography of, of Muhammad Ali. We've got a couple other projects which I'm serving just as executive producer on. But now we're beginning to rearrange the furniture for the 2020s, like the big series. We're going to do the American Revolution. We're going to do um, you are. a history You're going to tackle of LBJ the and civil rights. We're going to do something on Reconstruction. So what, what has been the biggest obstacle to your success, do you think? You know what? I feel so lucky, Kate. I've worked, I made a decision early on to work in public television. Someone the other day said, how come you didn't go to some place else, like right. Showtime or HBO or something to do this? I said, they, they wouldn't have spent $30 million and, more importantly, 10 years of real research to get the story of Vietnam right. And, and I've enjoyed that relationship with public broadcasting, which means that I've had to go out and convince people over and over again, yeah. reinventing the wheel a of, bit. of how to get the money. And that's okay. It keeps you honest. Is that we, the biggest obstacle? The biggest the obstacle is always raising the money. But then what happens is, is that we then get to make the film we want to make because these are underwriters, not investors slash It's not sponsors, the Hollywood, Hollywood model. Right, where they, yeah. well, the sponsor's Producers. unhappy with this or they want this or they. So if you, let me put it another way. If you don't like any of my films, it's all my fault, right? Because, and that's the way it should be. You shouldn't have to say, well, they wouldn't let me use this actor, she wasn't available, or they wouldn't let me use this director, they wouldn't let me do this car chase, they wouldn't let me not do this car chase. Whatever it might be, I don't have that. What do you tell young people? What do you tell the 20-somethings that might watch this and wonder, how on earth am I gonna get to where Ken Burns is? Well, you know, for somebody wanting to do this, I think that it's, it's particularly true in documentary, but I assume in every other um, professional pursuit, which is you got to know that this is what you want to do. There's lots of people who are drawn to the apparent, I want to emphasize, <laughs> apparent luxury and glamour right. of filmmaking. It's, it's very, very, very hard work, as everyone knows, and uh, the hours are long. Um, so you got to know that, and there's no shame to say I, I don't. I don't really have something to say, and to go and say I'm going to yeah. raise a family or attend a garden or build a but building. But if you know that, but if you know that, what do you do? Then you got to overcome the. Per you have to persevere. That is to say, you got to put those those two binders of of material on your desk. And the rejection and say, letters. You know what? It doesn't come easy. If it did come easy this probably is not working out the way you think it's working out. I mean, some people do have these, you know, just completely, you know, endowed arcs, and that's, that's fine. But most of us, it's a lot of trench work, and that's really, really important. And I would argue that public broadcasting has been central. I don't think any of the films I've made, from that first comment, an hour on a bridge, to, you know, when I said to the head of programming at, at, at PBS, I think it's no longer going to be eight episodes in 16 hours. I think it's going to be 10 episodes and probably 18 to 20 hours. She said, bring it on. Last thing, what is your favorite film? I don't have a favorite film. I guess, you know, somebody asked, you know, I'm, I always cop to the horrible cliche of, you know, I've got four daughters, I'd be a horrible father, and I am not a horrible father if I said, I liked one over right. the other, and I do not. I love them equally, and they are the my most important co-productions. Um, 
Duke Ellington, who's arguably our greatest composer and certainly our most prolific, something over 2,500 um, compositions, was once asked this, and he copped out with an elegant way, and Duke Ellington did everything elegantly. Someone asked him what's his most important composition. He said, the one I'm working on now. And so for me, Vietnam's done. It's no longer mine. It's yours. I'm happy sort of as a parent who's just kicked the child out and sent it off to college and there's a lot of bittersweet. <laughs> Lynn and I can sometimes we finish something and we'll cry because we miss not working on it. Mm -hmm. But like it's all country music for me right now. It's all earnest. Because that's your I next just, project. I just want to make that this film's better. I cannot wait until I sit down with that tabula rasa that this new screening represents for a new film and I go, okay, this is what we got to do. It's not, this isn't working. Or that's so great. Where where did you get the genius idea to use that piece of music or, or to pan that way to, to an editor and then and then I am a pig and you know what <laughs> you're still learning is what it sounds oh, like God, if you, you're you still learning this is the whole, this is the thing you're 64 64 years old okay. so so now we have these interns who come in and I, just a handful of them and it's just editing and I call on them now mostly first because when you're 21 you know everything and and people my age like to denigrate oh you just think you 21 you think you know anything they did know everything, and I knew everything too. Now I'm 64, I know nothing. I know how little I know, how much I want to know, how little time there is to know all of that. So I call on the 21-year-olds, and they give you, they know everything. So they say, this is it, you need to do this. Now I may not agree with it. I may, my own experience may, in some ways, transcend the fact that they know something. And maybe my ignorance is a, is a healthy thing, but I love to hear from people who know everything. So for me, it's lifelong learning. You never, that's what Thomas Jefferson meant by pursuit of happiness. It wasn't the acquisition of objects in a marketplace of things. It was lifelong learning in a marketplace of ideas. And if you turn that off, it ain't happiness. That's a good way to end. Ken Burns, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Really appreciate it.